When was the last time you had a conversation with somebody that you disagreed with? I mean, someone you were really at odds with on core big beliefs like immigration, abortion, globalization. It can feel like there's no middle ground to stand on. But if your beliefs fall somewhere between extremely pro or absolutely not, then you can still feel pressure to pick a side. So to make sense of why we're here and how we can create that space, we have to understand this one little word a bit better. Polarization, the act of dividing something, especially something that contains different people or opinions into two completely opposing groups. Let's break that down. Polarization divides something. There's no spectrum at play here. Instead, there's only two camps to split into. People in the middle end up separating into different buckets that appear to be much further apart than they really are. Worse, these buckets inherently oppose one another. Polarization is not disagreement. Disagreement is healthy. Strong opinions, even on the margins, are valuable. Polarization isn't that. Polarization means that you not only disagree, but you actively distrust and dislike the other side. It leads to things like only wanting to live near people who are like us, or not wanting our children to marry someone from the other side. And if someone from your side starts to compromise with the other side in any way, it's considered betrayal. Polarization is not a new phenomenon. It has fractured friendships and families, redefined religions and even started wars. But it also feels unusually bad these days. That's not to say that we all need to be centrists. It is perfectly fine to have unwavering views on something. But it's when you're not able to listen to the opposing side or when you have zero interest in finding common ground, that's when we run into problems. So if we know that polarization is such a problem, why do we keep polarizing? Well, science has some of the answers. Humans, by nature, categorize and classify the world around us. This can be good. It can develop our sense of belonging with others and help us work toward common goals. The flip side of that is we also tend to look at things in a binary way. We divide ourselves into us versus them. It's an impulse, a shortcut to help us simplify, sometimes oversimplify the complicated issues and questions that come up in life. And while all this sorting and classifying may help us understand our place in the world, you can see how when taken to its extreme, we can be quick to shut out people we disagree with. For example, take cancel culture. When someone is cancelled for a wrongdoing or perceived wrongdoing, it means they're called out, boycotted, and at times stripped of having a public platform or career. Cancelling someone can be an effective way to hold power to account. It can also be a severe form of punishment, one without a proper justice system. Of course, no matter how you feel about it, what we're actually doing here is leaning into our instinct to group. We're virtue signaling. We are not like them. Their values are not mine. Left unchecked, this can become an ugly cycle of deeper polarization, which can lead to self-censorship or worse, to violence. And there's more. Experts suggest that this binary thinking can make us vulnerable to getting locked into narrow mindsets. We lose sight of our common ground and start to favour all or nothing thinking. We allow members of our group to determine what we should care about or how we should feel about things rather than forming our own opinions. We begin to disagree with people based on their group instead of trying to understand their personal position. We fear speaking up, we struggle to engage on tough issues and make the other side out to be the enemy. And it's happening nearly everywhere. From Brexit in the UK to the rise of nationalism in places like Brazil, Hungary and Mexico, to the increase in racist and xenophobic attacks worldwide, 
The us versus them rhetoric that is so central to polarization is playing out on a local, national and international scale. And it's hitting us personally too. Polarization has very real implications for our health, our wallets and our communities. Studies suggest that increased polarization is linked to elevated and sustained levels of stress, which is damaging to our health and quality of life. Political polarization and gridlock can lead to government shutdowns, parliamentary stalemates and even political coups. All of which can result in the loss of millions, if not billions of dollars, not to mention the vital services that are lost in the meantime. Polarization can also cause an uptick in hate crimes and political violence. We've seen that play out globally during times of increased immigration and in the rise of anti-Asian hate crimes after the coronavirus was first identified in China. Instead of trying to find points of consensus, we dig our heels in. We don't see eye to eye and too often, we're okay with stopping the conversation right there. Okay, so if we know that human beings have a tendency to divide ourselves into us and them, and we know the serious ramifications of that, how do we go about solving this problem? Well, the first thing to do is to acknowledge that this is not a problem for everyone. In fact, for some people, polarization is very useful. The only collusion was committed by the Democrats, the fake news media, and their operatives. Take politicians, for example. Leaders on both ends of the political spectrum have ridden populist waves to power. They reached out to disenchanted voters, they demonized their opponents, and they inflamed existing tensions among the electorate to win. They tapped into groups who for too long had been ignored, and they offered another way. Strategically, they also weaponized polarization for their own benefit, and it worked. They're not alone. Over the last 20 years, the number of populist leaders in power across the world has doubled. And that's no coincidence. The takeaway is simple. Dividing electorates and depicting opponents as extreme drums up a lot of support. This isn't the only trend politicians are taking note of. We may think our leaders are master puppeteers, orchestrating everything we experience from the top down. But what's also likely is that our politicians are taking a bottom-up approach. They're trying to figure out what their most loyal constituents want to hear so they can appeal to those who will vote, fundraise and rally for them. It's a game and they know how to play it. Social media can be a great place to source those voices, but it also creates a problem for the rest of us. People who are engaged in politics on Twitter, for example, are already entrenched in their beliefs. Social media algorithms reward these extreme views with more exposure on their feeds. And so these posts are served up in a steady stream of content to people who already agree with them. It's a feedback loop. Conspiracy theories and disinformation also travel faster than fact on these platforms. There's a dangerous cycle at play here. Extreme viewpoints spread like wildfire across social media. This leads to increasing numbers of people who hold and echo those views. Then, politicians use those extreme views as cornerstones of their political platforms thus leaving a great majority of us without the ideological representation we should have. And let's be clear, politicians aren't trying to represent everyone that wouldn't win votes, but if they can tap into the desires of the most politically engaged people, they can and they have made great gains. Now, it would be easy to blame social media's algorithms for a lot of these problems, but we have to zoom out a bit. It's true that social media creates echo chambers where we're largely exposed to people who think like us. These platforms are incentivized, after all, to feed us exactly what we want to see. The more time we spend on their platforms, the more money they're able to rake in from advertisements. Given this, you could argue that if we only had exposure to a wider variety of perspectives, we would begin to understand each other better. 
Unfortunately, it doesn't really work like that. In a 2017 study of 1,220 American Twitter users who identified as Democrat or Republican, they were paid to follow an account that retweeted news from the opposite side. The result? Well, the participants actually became more entrenched in their existing beliefs. So instead of Republicans being more open to liberal policies or ideology, the study says that they became substantially more conservative. So while we'd like to think that exposure to different views and opinions will help depolarize our beliefs, it turns out that it doesn't actually work that way. Researchers have found that instead, storytelling, just telling people about our lived experience, can help open their mind to positions they would disagree with. It can also let the air out of a tense situation. It may not seem like it, but there are plenty of situations where you might disagree with someone, but still think of them as a good person. That's just not happening enough today because we're polarized. In fact, thinking like this can keep us from seeing what we have in common. In the US, where gun control is an extremely polarizing issue, Americans tend to focus on two fervent groups gun owners and gun control activists. By focusing on how these two groups differ, the public ignores what they, the majority, have in common. Fact, 90% of American citizens support universal background checks for gun purchases, something that has not been passed into law. Why? Because a polarized Congress and media focus on a zero-sum game between extreme voices. This gridlocks legislation and we appear much farther apart than we really are. The same logic can be applied to the global climate change debate. A recent study that surveyed over half of the world's population found that 64% of us believe climate change is a global emergency. This establishes far more common ground between us than if we were to focus on the tug of war between staunch climate activists and deniers. If we shifted our focus, imagine what we could accomplish. In the meantime, our civic spaces are diminishing. We're seeing an increase in human rights abuse and violence against journalists. Nations are turning inward rather than working together to solve problems. And we all suffer as a result. It's not surprising then that all of this is happening in parallel with increased polarization. So where do we go from here? How do we fight this predisposition to divide and group? And what does a depolarization playbook look like? Let's start with government. If you live in a democracy with a two-party system like in the US, politics is a zero-sum game. Having multiple parties, however, makes it harder for polarization to take hold because it structurally limits a binary mindset and gives us more options. Countries like Germany and Sweden also use proportional representation, which means that the number of votes that each party gets dictates how much representation they receive in government. Proportional representation gives more people a direct voice in policy, even if they're in the minority. It's worth noting then that Germany and Sweden have seen depolarization in recent years. Then there's social media, a tool that could harness technology to connect us rather than divide us. But it's clear now that we didn't do enough to prevent these tools from being used for harm as well. These platforms could benefit from more regulation. Companies could better manage the political targeting of ads or lend more resources to limiting disinformation by taking down or flagging fake news more consistently. Even being more transparent about how they prioritize the information we see would be a step in the right direction. As a user, you can start by approaching virtual interactions the same way you would approach a face-to-face -face exchange. There's a real person on the other side of that screen. Tell them your story and ask them questions to understand them better. Outside of the comments, consider if what you're sharing only exists to fan existing flames or if it could create space for dialogue. There's also more work we can do on a personal level. 
to combat some of the negative effects of our inclination to categorise ourselves into groups. And it's not all bad news to start. Studies show we think we're further apart than we really are with the people who disagree with us politically. We also tend to exaggerate how much those same people dislike us. So what we're doing here is making assumptions that are not true and, as a result, widening the gap between us. So how can we close that gap? Well, as hard as it might be, research shows that if we can look past partisan labels, if we can stop making assumptions that don't serve us, and instead, instead we focus on the people and the issues in front of us, we are well on our way to constructive conversations with people we don't agree with. We can also start by listening. Too often we listen not to actually hear and digest the information we're presented with. We listen with an intent to respond and in many cases defend our own stance. So get curious before you get defensive. Rather than only trying to explain your point, challenge yourself to see things from the other person's perspective. And let's normalize being unsure about some things. It's okay to not have the answer. And it's also okay to leave room for your opinion to change. We've talked a lot about how damaging it can be to group people into us versus them. There is a silver lining, however. While we do tend to view our group more favorably, the lines of who's part of our group are permeable. If we're open to it, we can expand our idea of us to include much larger subsets of our communities, our countries and our world. Because in the end, even though our stories might ring loudest for us, it doesn't mean that other people's aren't valid as well. It's when we can truly listen to one another, when we can really share each other's perspectives, that's when we will build mutual trust. It's when we'll recognize each other's humanity and maybe then we'll be able to have inclusive, thoughtful, productive conversations again. If you want to learn more about issues that divide us or how to overcome those divisions, why not check out my podcast course correction? In each episode, I talk to people about a controversial issue and I challenge myself to talk to people that I disagree with. Why don't you click here and check out course correction wherever you get your podcasts.